Okay, good afternoon. Um, this is the uh, Ops Manager 2012 setup and config talk. Um, I know earlier in the day we had an overview session, and I believe we had one the other day as well. And rumors I heard about those sessions were uh, that you guys had a lot of questions about setup and config and what the new Ops Manager uh, 2012 is going to look like. Um, this personally is one of my favorite sessions to give because for one thing, it gives you guys a, lot, a little bit of a peace of mind over what's coming and how you're going to get there. And also, um, in a way, it just uh, really shows you some of the strengths and investments we've made in the product. So with that said, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Rob. I'm a program manager on the Ops Manager team. I've been doing program management there for three years on the product group. Uh, before that, I've been working with uh, mom and the system center in uh, customer environments for many years. Uh, I work on uh, the core part of the team, so that, what that means is I do deployment, I own performance, uh, let's see, do scalability, um, maintenance mode, notifications, a lot of the uh, features that you're familiar with with the product um, I work with. Uh, Martin here is joining us as well, and Martin, if you want to say a few minutes. Yeah, sure. I'm Maarten Goed. I'm a System Center MVP from the Netherlands. Uh, in my daytime job, I help uh, enterprise customers implement System Center. And uh, yeah, it's a privilege for me to be working with Rob and his team on a technology adaption program around System Center Operations Manager 2012. And uh, yeah. Okay. So what I want you guys to get out of this session is a few things. First off, I want, to see, I want you guys to see how easy it is now to bring high availability to your Ops Manager deployment. Okay? I want you to see how easy it is to scale out your Ops Manager deployment, how you can go from a single management server and scale it out as, your, uh, as, your, uh, as things grow, as you need more and more capacity. And the last thing is, of course, upgrade. How are you going to get there? If you have these existing investments, you certainly don't want to throw it away. We want to make sure we can take your investment, move it forward onto the new platform. And so I'm going to show you through what, you know, I'll walk you through what that's going to look like and uh, give you a taste for what you need to do to prepare for that. So okay. Turn over to Martin. Yeah, thank you, Rob. So with that being said, let's have a look at the new topology. Um, if we go to the next slide, let's firstly quickly recap what the current topology is with System Center Operations Manager 2007 R2. Um, for those of you using Operations Manager today, you know that we have the notion of a root management server. It's this special server. It's actually the first management server that you install that gets to be the root management server by default. And it does all these functions that it does, um, up among which the console access. Uh, if you're using the console uh, or even the web console, you talk to the root management server and its SDK service to gain access uh, into the information. Uh, it handles the role-based uh, access control. Uh, it knows which roles which users are mapped to and make sure you get the views and the information that you belong to. Um, of course, it has the config service, which in essence distributes configuration to all your agents. So if you update a management pack or import a management pack, it sends them out, calculates configuration. Um, it handles the connectors to the other management systems. Uh, we have connectors out of the boss box, but also other connectors you could have. Uh, it handles the alert notifications, so it sees the subscriptions and makes sure that any alerts you subscribe to get sent uh, and the RMS handles that workflow. Um, we have health aggregation, of course. Um, we have all these unit monitors that uh, may flip health and make, um, make sure that you get uh, certain health states, but it aggregates and on a, on a high level uh, shows you which health we have. It does group calculations, uh, availability calculations, uh, the dependency monitors that sets uh, another unit monitor to red, if you will, uh, gets done on a workflow on the RMS as well. We have things like DB grooming, uh, and in essence, the RMS uh, handles the model-based management. Now, this introduces a few challenges because this is the one server that handles all these workflows. Uh, the first being performance and scalability, of course. If we have a lot of console connections, if we have a lot of uh, instances that, that get health, um, the RMS all needs to handle this, and we need to scale for that. So memory, CPU, all these things we need to take into account. And we have the option of scaling up, but not really the option of scaling out, because it's this single server. Um, in essence, it's some kind of single point of failure as well. If the RMS fails, um, you get a monitoring blackout. Uh, and this is something you want to prevent, of course. 
Uh, now, there are options for high availability today. Um, that all depends on your SLA, and we'll talk about that in the next slide, but um, we could do it high available, um, but it could be quite challenging. If you look at those high availability options, in essence, there are two things you could do. Um, of course, you could cluster your RMS, uh, active passive node, and the passive node would pick up if the active node would fail. Um, it does solve the single point of failure problem, but it could be somewhat complex to set up, um, but also to maintain if cumulative updates come out, uh, service packs, other things you need to apply to those systems. Uh, it's a special procedure you need to follow to make sure both nodes are up to date and, and keep kept the same. Um, that's scenario one. Um, that's if you want nearly uh, no monitoring blackouts, you might go with the clustering uh, uh, setup. Now, of course, if you'd have multiple management servers, um, you could actually promote uh, another management server to become the root management server in case of um, uh, unavailability of the original root management server. Um, it does require manual steps. There's a configuration tool you use from the command line where you actually handle these uh, demotion and promotion procedures. Uh, but it's, it's a viable uh, option if, uh, if, if it's something you, you need to do for disaster recovery. Now, what has changed in Operations Manager 2012 is that we no longer have this parent-child relationship. This root management server um, in current version is the parent of all these other health services that we brought back into. Uh, and in essence, that's why the root management server is this single point of failure. With 2012, with Operations Manager 2012, every management server is equal. And every management server could handle that workload. Um, and we get this, like, peer-to-peer -peer technology, if you will, and a group of management servers that can handle all these uh, workflows. Now, how do we handle all these workflows? Uh, we're introducing a concept, what we call the server pool. Um, the server pool is a grouping of health services, of management service, if you will. And on this group, we have the ability to distribute workloads. So by default, we get an all management service pool and any management server in your management group will be a member of this all management service pool. And these core workflows like group calculation, availability, uh, health rollups, uh, DB grooming, notifications, and so forth, uh, are handled by the pool uh, and actually automatically uh, distributed um, within the pool. Now, if you look at the management server, uh, a few things changed. If you remember, a root management server had three services, the SDK service, uh, the config service, and a health service, or a management service, as we call it since R2. Uh, and management service used to have only um, this management service, this health service. Today, with System Center Operations Manager 2012, the configuration service will actually run on all management servers, uh, which is a big a key part to distributing these workloads and making sure that any management server could potentially run that workload. Now, today in System Center Operations Manager 2007, um, the configuration data would actually be stored in memory in XML. And if you had a big environment with a lot of nodes, a lot of instances, a lot of configuration, it could potentially actually take some time for the configuration service to start up on your root management server and before it begins to work and, and starts to handle configuration. Now, what's changed in 2012 is that the configuration data itself is now stored in operations DB. Um, and that's actually the third bullet. That's why we get a faster startup. It doesn't need to process it all in memory, in essence, like rebuild all these tables in memory. Um, it now can read from the database, uh, and there we get a faster startup, even for bigger environments um, with lots of nodes and lots of configuration going on. In this case, we also have a smaller demand on local resources. And like Rob said, we want to lower the TCO. So today, with the scale up option of your root management server, you would actually maybe need quite some memory, quite some CPU uh, to all handle this. Today, with 2012, you'd need less memory and less CPU time to get all this done. Now, if we look at the SDK service, same thing. It now runs on all management servers. And that means that any operations manager console uh, can talk to any management server for connectivity. Uh, and that's something where we, again, allow all these management servers potentially to run these workloads. Now, with this, we're actually simplifying the topology. 
um, and addressing that we get an out-of-the-box high availability option. If we look at the current situation, you might have one management server, and that one management server would actually run all these core workflows, again, dependency monitors, availability, and notification, and so forth. Now, by adding a second management server, we automatically get this high availability. Uh, Operations Manager 2012 will see that there's a new management server belonging to the all management servers pool, and actually automatically start distributing these workflows uh, on these two management servers. So in this case, it might move the dependency monitors workflow and availability workflow to the second management server. Now, if we introduce a third management server, you'd actually see a recalculation happening behind the scenes and the infrastructure would make sure that another workflow, in this case, dependency mon monitors, would be moved over to this third management server and uh, workflows and workload would be split equally amongst the three. Now, what happens if a management server were to become unavailable? Again, the out-of-the-box HA would mean that the management group would recalculate that there's only two management servers left. Uh, we need to move the dependency monitors workflow because that was running originally on that management server. The third one picks that up and everything's fine. And if you look at um, the agents uh, below, then the one thing you saw is that agents are now reporting into the uh, second or first management server. Now, the agent failover itself didn't really change in Operations Manager 2012. You still, if you deploy an agent through push uh, methods through your console, originally install the agent, and the agent will actually get a list of all these management servers we have in our environment. And if the first one were to become available, it would just contact the second to make sure it starts communicating and back to the management group again. So this makes things easier. Now, if you look at other types of monitoring, if we're monitoring cross-platform machines like Unix and Linux, or we're monitoring network devices such as switches, today they might report back into a single uh, health service um, and be managed by a single health service. With, serv with System Center Operations Manager 2012, uh, you will actually see that these uh, devices and these computers will be handled and managed by the pool and on the pool level. Now, same thing here. If we lose a management server for whatever reason, uh, because it's being handled by the pool, these devices will actually uh, report back into the other management servers. Now, let's have a look at how the failover works. Wait a sec, there we are. So, what you're looking at is a virtual machine that we've called Red Management O2. And we've installed System Center Operations Manager 2012, uh, one of the early builds today in our technology adaption program. If you look at the left-hand side on the administration pane, you see a few new options. Under network management, you see discovery rules, network devices, network devices pending management. Um, and you have things like the resource pools, which we'll get into in the next few minutes. If you look at in our infrastructure, you'll see that we've installed two management servers, Red Management 2, where I'm now using my console from, and I'm using Red Management 1 as a, another management server that can handle these workloads. If I look at the node Unix Linux servers, you'll see that I've added one uh, Linux server, Red Xplat 2 that's healthy, that's being monitored uh, by my management servers. Now, what we did is we wrote a PowerShell script, which is called getUXmonPool.ps1. And what it does, it actually now queries the pool to see uh, from which management server this Unix computer is being monitored. So in this case, it's talking to um, the management server, getting all the Unix computers that are being monitored from this pool member, in this case, Red Management 02. And next up, it's looking at Red Management 01, my first management server, to see if the Unix Linux computer is being monitored from here, which, again, should be the case. Now, what we want to demonstrate in the next few seconds is that while this Unix Linux computer is being maintained and managed from this first management server, is that when this management server becomes available, that it actually automatically fails over to the other management server. 
And what we'll do is we'll take this VM, our first management server, and we'll actually pause it. And we'll quickly see if it's unreachable now. It is. So behind the scenes now, Operations Manager 2012 uh, will see that the first management server will become available. And in the next few minutes, we'll come back to see if that's uh, the case, that it automatically switched over. What's that? So to repeat the questions, will DCs and RODCs, in essence, Windows agents fell over as well? Well, like I just said in the slides, you see that the Windows agent behavior is the same as we have today. So if it gets pushed, it's talking to its primary management server, and if that primary, and it gets, with the push installed, it gets a list of additional management servers it can talk to. Now, if that first primary managed server would become unavailable, it would start to talk to the secondary. Could you use AD integration then to find its management server? That could be. You could use AD integration. Now, if you do the push uh, installation from the console, it would get the list as well. Uh, but AD integration is a very good option to set. Uh, Um, can we hold your question? Until, let's get through the rest of that. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll get back. back to that in a second. So looking at the console, uh, what we said is we now have the concept of uh, resource pools. So out of the box, we got this all management server resource pool. Um, but as you can see, we created a resource pool called Linux pool. It was created manually. In our case, if we have a look at the properties and the membership, we've added both management servers um, herein. Now, if I look at the right hand side and can create these resource pools, so I could say take at Atlanta pool. And if we go to pool membership and search, again, I can just add the management servers that I want to add to this pool that I want to use for a certain type of monitoring for certain production cross plat machines, production network switches, uh, whatever. We'll cancel out on this one. Now, if you look at those resource pools, uh, you see manual and automatic. Why manual and automatic? Well, let's say you have a text message device, an SMS device, physically bound to one of these management servers. Um, if you create a notification subscription, you want to make sure that only the management server that has the connection physically to that device handles those notification subscriptions. So that's where you would set it to manually, just add that single server and use that pool for that type of communication. Now, of course, with automatic, any management server we will add to the environment um, will actually be added to that pool, uh, and that can be used for any type of monitoring. Now, if we look at the cross-plat form discovery wizard, then there are a few things that have changed uh, if we have a closer look at the discovery wizard. In this case, we can define the criteria for discovering the Unix Linux computers. I can click Add. I can actually click the discovery scope and either use the DNS host name, I can use the IP address, or I could even use an IP range, IPv4 or IPv6, to make sure we detect them. Now, in this case, I'll add my second cross-plat machine called Red XSplat R1. Hit save. We can do um, discover all the computers, thereby installing the agent or discovering computers that have already got the agent installed. We can set credentials. Uh, this is something new in Operations Manager 2012. We can use SSH key. Um, but of course, we could also use the username and password. <clears throat> we'll hit OK, and we'll hit Save. And the one thing you see here on the bottom is that we're not able to select a management server anymore, but we need to select a management pool. In our case, the Linux pool uh, for which we could actually discover this computer from. Now, with a little bit of luck, we'll run the script again, and let's see if the cross-platform machine was actually failed over to the other management server. 
It's looking at the second management server, querying which Unix computers are being monitored from that pool member. It's actually showing up XSplit 02 now, and now trying to talk to the first management server, which is unavailable, to see if any Unix computers are being monitored from there. Now, that won't be the case. It nicely failed over. We did nothing uh, behind the scenes. We had no monitoring blackout. Uh, in this case, monitoring went on. I mean, availability was there for our uh, system. OK. So with that said, what did we get from the new options in Operations Man Manager 2012? Well, we're reducing TCO. Why? We can scale out in our server management pool. We can actually add management servers. And as you saw, workloads will be automatically uh, distributed amongst all those members. Um, easier deployment, no need for setting up clusters and, and, and maybe uh, maintaining patches uh, on that with the process. We can increase scale, um, and we get out of the box of high availability. As you saw in the demo, we don't need to do anything to make sure that our agents and devices we're monitoring are being fell over to this other member. Okay, Rob, could you tell a bit about the setup and upgrade we have in 2012? Absolutely. So in Ops Manager 2012, we have uh, completely rewrote the setup experience. Um, we take a lot of feedback from the customer. We, there was definitely um, some concern about the, the setup the way it was in the past. So we took that to heart. We went through. We rewrote setup. And I'm actually going to show you guys what it looks like. I'll show you how you can actually set up a new management server um, in a new management group, how you can add to an existing management group. and. Uh, We'll go through uh, a couple of the other examples I have with sharing like data warehouse. Um, before I do that, though, what I'd like to do is quickly talk to you guys about the prereqs. So in Ops Manager 2012, of course, we have to update our prereqs for what we support for what you can install your databases on, your gateways on, your management servers, and uh, even what you can do with your agents. So in 2012, we now require Windows 2008 R2. And that, of course, will be 64-bit because it only shipped in 64-bit. We also require SQL-wise, you have to be at least at SQL 2008 SP2, which we did support SQL 2008 SP2 in R2. So moving forward won't be that difficult when you think about how you would upgrade on. We also, of course, support SQL 2008 R2 as well. So keep that in mind as well as you're thinking about what you need to do to get ready for deployment. If you're going to be building new management servers in your R2 environment, you may want to think about moving to the newer uh, the updated uh, specs that we have for Ops Manager 2012, because it will make your upgrade easier and go more smooth. The last thing to make note of is we require .NET 4.0 on our management servers. Okay, not our gateways, but our management servers. We require that now. So that'll be just something you're going to need to prep ahead of time as you get ready to uh, install for the first time or do an upgrade. Um, as far as agents are concerned, um, agents, we support the same operating systems we supported for, uh, in the past for versions of Windows. Um, the only one that, that we've actually um, taken out is Windows 2000. We no longer support Windows 2000 for agent, but everything past that we do. So um, for the most part, that shouldn't impact many of you. But just to keep that in mind as you're moving forward. So what I'd like to do is actually show you what the new setup looks like, and we'll walk through a couple of the scenarios. So what I've got here is the new wizard for installing 2000, um, 2012. Um, you can see here, this is just our, the standard ULIS screen. But even the, even the smallest things we've added to make it better is now our privacy statement, for example, as a hyperlink. And you'll see that throughout the wizard. In the past, you actually would have to like manually look at it and try to type it out if you wanted to go to our privacy statement. It wasn't actionable. So we actually have actionable links throughout the whole entire experience now. And you'll see that for, like, from descriptions to health links to all sorts of things. So um, in this, you can see that we have uh, in integrated actual reporting into our main setup. It used to be actually a separate setup before. Um, and it is not anymore. So we made sure to get that in there so you don't have to keep running multiple setups. You can just do it all in one shot if you want to do an all in one install. Um, as you can see, you can actually go ahead and hit, some, hit the little down arrow here and you can get a description. You can not only see you know, what does this service do, what does this component do, but you know, what, does the, what are the requirements. Um, before we, again, you would have to go to a doc and look it up and say, hey, you know, I need this, I need that. Um, but here, we're going to try to list out exactly what the requirements are going to be. And we plan, this is, uh, this is still you know, before beta build, but as we get further along, we're going to update the requirements to be more specific to each of the components. Um, and as you can see, you can go down the list and look at everything that you can go ahead and install. 
We also have a link right there to the supported configs doc. This is by far like the bread and butter of the support statement for the product. It's the most common question I get is, is this supported, is that supported? So you can just look it up on the doc, but sometimes it's hard to find. We try to make it as discoverable as possible for you by putting a link right there in setup for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit next here. Um, this is a very standard, you know, pick the location. It tells you how much free space you have. Hmm? Database used to be in the install. It's a good point. Uh, the database is now a part of management server install. And I'll show you the database screens in just a moment. So it would be on the all-in-one. So to answer the question, it would be on the all-in-one. Yes, you would have to install wherever you wanted to actually put it locally. Yep, no, great question. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and verify the prereqs. What this is doing right now is it's checking operating systems, platforms, uh, .NET versions, as you can see, memory. Um, we have a couple other small things we require that I'll go through and do the checks for. It hasn't actually asked you, if you noticed, anything about the DB yet. We're gonna get to that in a moment. The reason is um, that we don't have the DB up front and do the prereqs after that is because we don't know the name of the DB yet. So we'll actually, what we'll do is on the next screen, well, first we'll, let me review this one for you real quick here. So you have two choices here. You create a new management group for the first time if it's a clean install, or if you wanna add to an additional, uh, add a management server to an existing install, you pick the second option. I'll go back and show you that one in a moment. So for the first time through, let's go ahead and uh, go through like if we were doing a brand new install first time, and we'll just use Atlanta for our man management group name. So, let me back this up a second here. So, what it's doing right now is uh, whenever you change the name in the server window here and then you hit tab, it'll actually go ahead and s try to validate and see, is this a SQL Server? Is it running SQL Server 2008 R2 or SQL T Server 2008 SP1? So it validates that. It'll validate, like I said, the platform, make sure it's a 64-bit version of SQL Server. It will check the perms. Does the person doing the install have the correct permissions to actually go ahead and install on SQL? So it actually does that all under the covers just by actually just typing in the name of the server and then going through, it'll do all those checks. Then the next thing it checks, it says, hey, you know, does that database already exist? You can see that I actually have Ops Manager already installed in this environment. And so it sees that there's an Ops Manager database there. If I hover over it, it'll say, hey, you know, this database name already exists. Please give us another name. So we can just go in here and type something different and the message will go away. Another thing to make note of, is you see, when you hover over it, it says the text has been copied to the clipboard. We do this on purpose, because if you do get an error message for a permissions problem or something when you're trying to set up your SQL DB, I don't want you guys to have to try to get out like a piece of paper and write down the message, because of course, as soon as you move the mouse, it disappears on you. So what we do is we copy it to your clipboard for you. So if you do want to like search for a problem that you're having with trying to get the SQL database installed, go ahead and just paste it right into your search engine and you can just go off and find the, you know, look for some answers. Um, so with that said, we'll, um, for the database file, um, for the fi file and the log locations, we pull this right from the SQL server. So again, we're grabbing this information, pulling it in and populating it for you. And of course you can change the defaults if you so wish. So, I'm gonna use the same SQL Server and the, the UI is very similar. Now you notice that I'm asking you about the data warehouse, but if you recall, I didn't actually check off reporting. That's a change in 2012. So in 2012, we require a data warehouse. It's, ne it's, a, nece it's, ne it's a necessity for the product at this point. We have some new features we call dashboards, which you probably saw in the overview. And those dashboards, that data is stored in the data warehouse, not the operational DB. So therefore, we need to ask you, where do you want to put your data warehouse? In small environments, you can just share the same SQL server that you were using for your operational DB. And in this case, you'll notice that we have two choices. We can either create a new one, or we can use an existing one. This is similar to what we had in R2. In R2, we allowed you to share one data warehouse with multiple management groups, and we still allow this today. So if you did want to have uh, 
you know, if you did not want to build another data warehouse, you can actually share an existing one. And if you look from the drop down, it says, yep, there's one already there. We can just go ahead and pick it and we can move on. So this is the account screen. Um, one of the things we added to the account screen is we used to have to go and look up in the security guy, oh, geez, what do I need for this account? What do I, what do I put for this? We actually added um, the descriptions down here to try to make it easier for you to determine what you need to do and you know, what these accounts and what, these, you know, what kind of functionality are we going to be doing here. So you can look through this now without having to search around in the documentation. Um, another thing we do that is if I actually go ahead and try to... Uh, if I fat, you know, mess up a password, it actually checks right there. We're actually going to validate and check the password for you. We're not going to let you get all the way through, hit you know, install, wait through install, we'll let it fail, then you search for value three and find out that you've typed a password wrong. We're actually trying to be a lot more proactive now on this. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to check the passwords for you, make sure that they are actually correct. And again, if you hover, you, know, you can see again that it tells you exactly you know, what the problem was. So this is just this um, very typical uh, you know, customer experience program screens that we have these in R2. And so of course we'll go through and answer yes to both of these. And Microsoft update screen so it can go ahead and check for updates. And then you'll have your installation summary. So that, th that's actually a walkthrough how you would actually install a, uh, your very first management server in a new management group in 2012. If we back this up. and we select the other option here, to build on what Martin was showing you earlier, how he showed you that you could start from a very small deployment, one management server, right? You, you, you're just new to, to, to OM. You, you don't know what you're going to be doing yet. So you want to start small. You buy one management server, you set it up, and you're ready to go. But as things go and people learn about, hey, you've got this really great monitoring product out there, and they're like, can you start monitoring my stuff? You may find that you may deploy more and more agents, and you may need to start to scale out. And what we want to do is make scale out as easy as possible for you. So if you, when you're ready to build your second management server, you just choose the second choice here that just says add the management server to the existing. And all you need to do, you don't even need to know the name of the management group. Just pick the SQL server and the database that it's installed on. Hit next. It's going to go to that operational database. It's going to pull in the information that it needs for the rest to fill in the rest of the wizard. And you can then just walk through and just go ahead and hit install. We're trying to make it as easy as possible to add a second management server so you can scale out quickly and you don't have to go back and look at your notes from what you may have installed you know, nine months ago. And so the rest of the wizard again looks the same. So, okay. All right. So, just to summarize what we have here, it, it is less clicks to install. Um, it is a more robust experience. We have, you don't have to run multiple wizards anymore. It has the same look and feel that what you're used to um, in uh, the other system center products. Um, and we have real time guidance now. We actually don't, are trying to get you guys away from having to look through all these docs. I think there's like five different guides you almost have to look through to deploy 2007 R2. We're trying to get it to a point where you can just walk through the wizard, read through it, and get this deployed successfully. Which brings us to upgrade. So upgrade was definitely, um, as you can see, and the reason we started with the topology simplification, showing you how we've done the resource pools, how we've scaled out the config service, the SDK service, um, to show you, we, we start with that to show you that upgrading will be complex, but we tried to make it as easy as possible. So what I'm going to show you through this next set of slides is we really looked at the feedback. We wanted to try to bring every management group forward we could. Our goal really was that there should be no environment in R2 that's out there that you cannot upgrade. There should be no reason that you would ever have to start over having to like, export and re-import your management packs, having to redeploy your agents. The goal here is that you can actually move forward um, keeping your investments that you have. And I'll actually walk you through kind of what a large distributed environment is going to look like. So I'll talk about the upgrade path in a bit, but let me walk you through to just give you an idea of what you're going to be looking at. So 
on this slide here, this is a full R2 environment. This would be a, a fairly typical medium-sized environment. They have a couple management servers. They have the root management server. They've got the data warehouse. They've got the ops manager DB installed. You can see, actually, on the right-hand side, um, I have one machine that's still a 32-bit management server. It's maybe the, one of the first ones, an early one I deploy. And if you remember from what I told you in the setup slide, we, that we do require now that you have Windows 2008 R2, and that is a 64-bit machine. So your really first step is like almost a, a precursor to, to begin an upgrade, is to get your environment over to a, a startable point. So for this example here, we would actually say just build another management server on the supported platform uh, for uh, 2012, and then go ahead, move the agents over to it, and remove the old management server. And so you'll want to hop through your management group, removing the old unsupported devices. And so it looked like this. At this point, we're still R2. We've done nothing. We haven't installed any new uh, OM12 uh, bits at this point. Uh, but at this, where we are right now, we're at a great starting point. Everything meets the, the uh, requirements for OM12. We can actually start the upgrade. And this is a very different upgrade than what we had in R2. Um, just to level set, if you remember in R2, you actually started at your root management server, upgrading that first, which upgrades your operational DB. Then you move through doing all your secondary management servers, gateways, and then finally you, get into, you upgrade your agents as one of the last steps. Um, this is a very different process. We actually start at one of the secondary management servers. So we don't touch the RMS. We leave that alone. We, we do this purposely because we don't want to cause... Uh, um, any kind of uh, major outage in your management group. But what we will support is if you actually upgrade a R2 management server, one of your secondary ones, to OM12, it will act in back compat. It will fully function in your R2 management group, just like uh, you, you, wouldn't, you won't even know the difference. What you will see, though, is any agents that were reporting to that newly upgraded management server now will pop into your pending management view in your R2 console. So what you will do is you will actually go, using your R2 console, go to pending management, look at the agents, and go ahead and approve them for upgrade, and your agents will be upgraded. Now, why, we have it this way for a very important reason. The agents themselves, um, the, an R2 agent itself, will not work talking to an R, to a OM12 management server. There's a lot of differences in the technology, but we were able to take the, R, the OM12 agent, make it back compat, to work, to work uh, back with the R2 management group, R2 management server, and working, of course, with its own OM12. So we, we've, set, we've set this up in such a way that you can actually go through, upgrade all your management servers, upgrade your gateways, upgrade your agents, still using your R2 environment, and your management group is still going to perform like it's an R2 management group. You will not get any new features until we do the final piece of upgrade, which will be at the RMS level, and I'll get to that in a moment. So what we've done here is we've actually gone through the rest of the uh, management group, and we're getting ourselves into a spot where we're preparing to do the real final upgrade. And so you could run like this for a while. If it takes you a couple months to get to this point, I can understand. You may have thousands of agents, and that's fine. Uh, you, so this environment will be supported. It's almost in like a, a mixed or hybrid mode at this point. Uh, but what you will do is we, you'll finally, when you get to this spot, you will go ahead and you'll go to your RMS. Now, if your RMS is a single RMS, it's not clustered, it is on the right platform, right? It's server 2008 R2. You can go ahead and run your upgrade right from here. And I'll show you what we'll do if it doesn't meet this next. But if you run the upgrade from here, we're actually going to go ahead and at the same time, we're going to install your operational, well, we're going to upgrade your operational database, and we're also going to do your data warehouse for you. Now, if you don't have a data warehouse, which is possible, um, we will show you the screens and say, hey, where would you like to put your data warehouse? So we'll actually walk you through a part of the setup that you saw earlier. It'll say, hey, go here, you know, pick your SQL server, let's run the, you know, it'll run a quick validation, making sure that you have the right permissions, and then it will go ahead during this final piece here and actually um, install a data warehouse for you if you don't have one. Now, at this point, once the database has been upgraded, so once we've got your database upgraded there, your R2 console will no longer work. We've actually gone ahead and crossed over to being OM12. 
So at this point, your R2 console doesn't work anymore. So what you'll have to do is either go and upgrade your R2 console or just go and install a new OM12 console and point to one of the management servers that are in that collection there. So you can, just so, so you're aware, if you still have two management groups, one is R2, and now you've gone ahead and upgraded a different management group to OM12, but you wanted to still have your R2 console. After you've upgraded your R2 console on your client to OM12, you can go back and reinstall your R2 console. So you could actually have both consoles on the same machine, just to make it easier for you if you have multiple management groups, just to be aware of. So. The console will work on, it will work on Vista, Win 7, Server 2008, Server 2008 R2, okay? It does not work on the XP technology, the Server 2003, okay? So now, last thing is here is the uh, SRS service. You just go over to that one, go ahead and run the upgrade on that, and we'll go ahead and do an in-place upgrade for you to keep your investments there as well. It's, well. I'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, great question. I'll, but so the other thing to think about is what if your RMS doesn't meet the requirements? And this could be quite a few people out there. Um, you've clustered it because you needed the high availability. So I think one of the concerns I, I've, I've heard is that they're worried that they're going to have to go and do a promotion and promote away from the RMS cluster. And running the promotion is always uh, um, tricky. Um, it's a difficult tool to work with, and it, uh, it requires you to do a very large backup to get going with it. So we all didn't want to force anybody to actually have to try to promote away from their clustered RMS. So we had to figure out a way around this. So what we decided to do is if you go to one of your secondary management servers, like you see where the arrow is flashing right there, we actually will give you the ability to run what we call a rolling upgrade. And if you start from that box there, we, again, will upgrade your environment, but at the same time, we're actually going to uh, remove your clustered RMS for you. So, and even if it's not clustered, say it was just a 32-bit one and you just didn't feel like, you know, removing it from your environment. Same rules basically apply. You go ahead to that secondary management server, you run the rolling upgrade. We're, again, going to upgrade your database. We'll upgrade your data warehouse for you. And we're going to, the R2 console will stop functioning. But the important thing to make note here is that we're going to groom out your root management server. So if you still have a management pack, say it's targeting something called the root management server. There's an instance in there, right? And you, the reason is maybe because you have the Exchange MP or the Active Directory MP. What we do is on that secondary management server over there on the right, uh, the one that you ran the upgrade from, we will make that what we call the RMS emulator. And it will basically appear to some of these management packs for legacy support reason that there is still a root management server, though in the management group in any way, shape, or form does not need that to run. So that's just for back compat reasons. How do you choose between these two upgrade models? Depends on your environment. So the question is how do you choose between which upgrade path to go? I would always advise if your RMS meets the minimum requirements for OM12, upgrade from there. Your life will be easier. It's an easier transition. But if it doesn't meet it, don't panic. We have a way around it for you that you can still fully upgrade, move forward, keep your investments without having to worry about going back and trying to move roles around and things like that. Is it presenting itself as an option? What we try to do is give you a recommendation in the prereq that says you do have an RMS that meets the requirements, so we think you should upgrade from there first. But it's still your choice if you don't want to for whatever reason, if you don't want to keep it. So with your RMS 2008, uh, what was it? You're saying install 2008 R2 over top of it and then upgrade? Yep. Yep, just upgrade the RMS. You would prefer that over phasing it out? Through the I would say that the reason I would say I would prefer that over phasing it out is you have to remember that if you remove the RMS completely from the environment, you may have connectors, various um, automation in your environment, right, 
councils that are pointing at that RMS name. Now, if we phase out your RMS, which we may have to do depending on how, you know, what your environment is, it will be extra work for you because you're going to have to repoint those things at one of the new management servers. The only other option you have is that if we do have to remove your clustered RMS, you can actually take the virtual name that you were using for it and just build another management server, use the same name. That way, you don't have to change all of your automation and code. So that's a workaround that we've kind of, you know, that we will actually publish is, you know, that would be a good best practice way of getting around making a lot of changes in your system. So, so with rolling upgrade, what, what the, like the, the takeaways is I want to show you is it, it is a phased approach. It isn't like when we upgraded to R2. When you upgraded from SP1 to R2, you really had to go through, um, I would say, you really had to do it in one shot. It, there wasn't a lot of uh, you know, leeway there. You had to go through and get your RMS upgraded, your management servers, your gateways, and most your agents. Because even your agents um, used to complain a little bit until you had them upgraded to R2. In this model, we kind of have a more of a phased approach. You can, get, you can work on it as you can to get the various components upgraded first before you pull that final trigger. All right. So again, the other thing that we want to make note here is if you've noticed, I didn't tell you that there's a lot of outage here. There's not a lot of downtime. The only time that you will have any downtime is when we upgrade your operational DB. This is the only period of time that you really have any major outage. And we're looking at numbers right now in preliminary testing that it's under a half hour to do the whole DB. And that's on a really large scale on a much smaller DB, um, like under 500 agents that will go much quicker. Um, and the last thing to show you is that our, we, ha we show the same UI um, going through both that you would see in setup. So it'll be, it, sh it should be simple for you to do. Um, we're going to provide you guys a lot of guidance with it as well. And uh, we can t pretty much tackle any kind of management group that you have out there and bring you forward without starting over, which is a big difference from what we did when we had a major change between MOM 2005 and Ops Manager 2007, where you had to pretty much migrate and start over. You do not have to do this. We're back compat with the MPs. We try to take your entire, entire investment, your runners accounts, your notifications, everything you've got, your custom knowledge, your reports, and we're going to take that all forward with us. Now, to kind of recap at what we talked about here, at a high level, and I'd like to leave these on the slides for you guys because you guys all do get a copy of the slides, and this is something that you could review later as well, is that with the first thing you want to do is, again, um, do an in-place upgrade of R2. We recommend that. Make sure that you change your agent assignments from the R2 servers to the OM12 servers as you go through the process of doing this. Um, a thing to note is that uh, we, we require that no agents report to the RMS to keep you highly available. Um, make sure that you move your agents off the RMS before you actually go through the upgrade itself. So that's just a, a, a pointer and something that you'll learn in the documentation and stuff that we will provide. Um, and uh, the big thing is uh, on this slide, I've kind of captured it pretty well here, is that you have the two options, right? Again, you either have, a, you have an RMS that can be upgraded or you have one that doesn't, and you have to pick which path you're going to go down uh, depending on your environment. Um, Yes, in the database and the operational DB, there is a major schema change. In the data warehouse, there is not. There is that chance, yes. Yeah. Yep. But for reporting uh, purposes, you should always report to the DW and not to the operational DB, of course. Are your reports today targeted to the data warehouse? Okay, because I think the best practice for reporting would be always to use the views in the data warehouse, which in essence the data warehouse has the same information as operational DBS. So even though the operational DB will change uh, somewhat internally, your reports should function if you target the DW as a source. Yeah. So let me, I have a, quite a few FAQs. Let me go through them first and then I'm going to be, I, I always save a lot of time for this talk to take questions because I know you guys are, in my experience of doing this one, there's usually generally a ton of questions for this. But just to kind of, I want everybody to be, you know, so they understand at least some of the more common ones that I've had over uh, the last um, about year and a half. Um, first one is, what about the all-in-one install? So you, what, you, you only have one management server, right? That's it. You have one management server and you've got, you know, everything installed on that one. So what do you do about this? How do you upgrade? 
So I would say the, the, the answer, there are two answers to this question. If your all-in-one install meets the requirements, so it's server 2008 R2 already, you could go ahead and run upgrade from here. The problem's going to be that your agents are still R2 at this point, right? And so if your agents are R2, when you upgrade that RMS fully up to uh, OM12, the agents will stop reporting because they're not going to understand the management pack schema that's being sent down to them. But those agents will still show up in pending management where you can approve them, they'll get upgraded, and then they will light back up and work. So the thing to remember if you have an all-in-one install and you fall into this boat is that you will have an outage at the monitoring level until you upgrade the agents. Now, because you only had one management server to begin with, that's probably not that big of a deal to you, and you could probably live with that. If it is a big deal for you, then you would want to build another management server and then just follow along with what we've showed you before, and then you just have like a distributed model at that point. So, can I install the console ahead of time? Um, this is, uh, you absolutely, by the way, can set your consoles up ahead of time before you run the final rolling upgrade. Um, just if it sees an R2 console when you try to install it, it will upgrade that R2 console and then you'll have to put the R2 console back. So just keep that in mind as you're planning your upgrade deployments on how you want to tackle the console upgrades. Um, will my R2 agents still work is a pretty popular question. And the R2 agents will work in that hybrid mode that I showed you, but once you've upgraded, done the final upgrade, and you're running now with the databases and everything on OM12, your agents, your R2 agents will no longer work. Um, we actually will see them trying to report in, and we will block them at the health service level on a management server or gateway because we don't want a lot of noise and we don't want to, you know, anger the logs. What we do in prereq, though, when you go through in prereq, we do tell you that we still find agents that haven't been upgraded yet and warn you of this ahead of time um, before you run the final upgrade. Now, your OM12 agent works back compat with R2. So if you have an R2 management group, you can still multi-home and go ahead and, and point to, I think we support up to four um, management groups per agent, so you can go ahead and still multi-home it back. Um, at least uh, three times uh, if, that, if you need to do that. So uh, what happens if, so a popular question I get is, you know, what happens if something goes wrong? Well, before you start the upgrade, our best practice is always to back up your DBs, of course, because that is always your final line of defense. We are doing a lot of validation and looking at putting in some rollback to help you if, a, if an upgrade does go wrong, we can roll you back so you don't have to start over and rebuild. Um, that is, uh, but again, remember to always back up your DB. That will be, of course, your first line of defense if uh, you didn't need, if your upgrade for whatever reason, like power ran out in the building or something strange happened, that you needed to uh, start back. Mark? Yeah. So, what about the AC, ACS collect? There's a popular question we had at the booth this week as well. Well, audit collection services are framework where we do security monitoring, security auditing with. Uh, ACS itself doesn't really change in System Center Operations Manager 2012. Uh, we do have some performance and, and, and performance fixes, of course, in there. But same thing, we still need to run the ACS collector on a management server or a gateway. Uh, we still have uh, our ACS uh, database. The agent still is the forwarder that is sending the security events to the central ACS collector. So in general, ACS will stay the same, and any investments you're doing today in ACS will carry forward in, uh, in 2012. Um, and like Rob just said, what about the workflows that were targeted to the RMS? Uh, introducing a new role called the RMS emulator. It's actually something, if you look at the console, and um, we'll go back real quick to the second management server we had. If you go to administration to management servers, and you're amongst the first to see this, you actually see a new column called the RMS emulator, which shows you visually now which of the management server is taking this role. And any of these management packs that target the root management server um, would actually uh, be targeted to this one. Now, in um, OM12, there actually will be uh, PowerShell commandlets that allow you to move this role to another management server. But again, the first management server we uh, upgrade to 2012 will actually get this RMS emulator and get this, this tag, but we, we can move it around if we really need to using PowerShell. Yep. Okay. Uh, we're going to take Q&A in a second here. Um, as I said, I, I always try to leave 
enough time for the deployment talks to, to answer your questions because everybody has a lot of edge cases and particulars that they want to speak with. Uh, just uh, there, this is the second session for Ops Manager tomorrow morning. Uh, Martin and I are doing the networking session as well. And then there's MPs and dashboards that, that are on Thursday. So uh, just keep these uh, dates in mind if you're interested in, to learn more about Ops Manager 2012. Um, we also have a, a series of hands-on labs, so just take a look at those. Again, um, if you want to learn, try and play around with these things, the new Avacode stuff, uh, check that stuff out. And we have something new that we've announced in TechEd, and it's our, uh, it's our community evaluation program. So this is something new that we're trying to do that uh, we've just opened it up that you can register for now. What you can actually um, do is if you've, we're taking 400 customers, you register for the program, you get the actual bits at beta that you can play around with. And what we'll do is we have our own private forms for you with the product group support and CSS support that you can actually go and we'll give you like a lesson every two weeks. Say, we want you to play with a new networking feature. We want you to play with this new feature. We want you to try dashboarding. We want you to try upgrade. And then we will talk about those topics and get your feedback. So it gives you an excellent idea and preview of the product, it gives you a chance to learn about it as early as possible and provide us, the product group, feedback on things that you liked or didn't like while there is still time for us to take your feedback before we ship. So check this out. Um, and it's just simply sending an email to mscp at microsoft.com if you're interested in joining this program. So I will uh, back it back up to FAQs. So if anybody has any questions, you can actually raise your hand, and I will uh, we'll tackle them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, boy. I saw your hand first, so I'm going to go with you, and I'll work my way to the right. When you do the upgrade, uh, you have installed a lot of management packs, and also third-party management packs. Could that be a problem, or do you know for sure that those management packs are We are fully backward compatible. Repeat the question. So, <laughs> the qu yes, thank you. Yeah, the, the question was, if you have partner management packs, are they going to be compatible when you go ahead and upgrade to 2012? And the answer to that is we are fully compatible. Uh, with any R2 management pack, okay? And so, and it will, we will be able to bring that management pack forward. Um, so I would say you may want to enter in the program and try it out just to, you know, you know take some of the, uh, you know, just to get an idea uh, if it will work. But yes, we actually test quite a few and our partners are engaged to make sure that this will work. Um, the reason we left the RMS emulator in there is to provide this back and pat for partners that did use the root management server class. I think I, uh, gentleman over there. Is there an upgrade for the? You mean the service level dashboard? Is there an upgrade for the service level dashboard? Uh, I. For the scorecard application. That, that one I'm not sure on. You'll have to come find me after and we'll talk. All right. Red shirt in the front. How many devices per management group are now? Are you talking network device or agent? Windows agents, okay, so we are looking at 15,000 agents per management group um, for uh, 2012. How many, how many management servers would you need for that? How many management servers you would need? I would say three management servers. So 5,000? Yeah. Yep. You have 18,000? Yeah, you Gentleman in the back? Yep, you. Manual agents, so the question is, how do you upgrade a manually installed agent? For manually installed <coughs> agents, you need to upgrade it in the same way you originally deployed it. So if you, have, if you use Config Manager to deploy it, we'll just run the MSI with an upgrade switch that we have for the agent install, and it will just upgrade the agent for you. Um, you will not need to redeploy your certificates for your gateways or anything like that. Mom's cert import? No. Yes, originally when you deployed the agent to get the cert working, you had to run the, the mom cert, but you will not have to do that. The cert is good. We keep the cert. We don't make you regenerate it. So it just, it's just a, it's a simple MSI with like a switch for upgrade, and you just deploy it, like you just run it the same way you ran it in the past. 
you know, when you did the original deployment. So you, the order is management servers first, secondary management servers, gateways, then your agents. Okay. If you if you do the agents first before you've done your R2 man, management server, you may run into some weird uh, compatibility issues. So you want to follow management servers, gateways, then agents. That's the proper order. Yes, sir. Yes. So a way pending management works, pending management is calculated at the management server level. So if you have an environment where you have a management server, a gateway, and then a bunch of agents, you upgrade your management server first. These agents down here will actually pop into pending. And if you approve them before you approve the gateway, because the gateway doesn't have the OM12 bits yet, they're just going to re-get the R2 bits they had before. So again, the order is always going to be management server, gateway, then agents. If you stick to the order, you shouldn't run into uh, any of those strange, you know, anomalies. All the way in the back. Uh, Martin, do you want to take this one or do you want me to? Hey, go ahead. Okay, so the way pools work, it's an excellent question. The question is, all right, what if you have, you know, three managed servers, two of them are four proc machines, and one of them is only a two proc machine with half the amount of memory. Are we calculating that and taking that into consideration when we balance the load on the management servers in the pool? So the, the answer to that is we treat everybody equally. We do not actually analyze or look at the hardware. We, we look, so the advice will always be the same as what Windows <laughs> clustering advice is. Have the, all the management servers, if you can, be of the same hardware. So that way you'll get a consistent experience. It doesn't matter where things land. You'll always have a consistent experience, which is, again, what the Windows team is. Uh, you know, that was always their advice with clustering. So does that answer? Standalone environment with standalone SQL Server, and I'm planning on moving to my database to a different SQL Server. Should I do that before I upgrade or after? Like, is the process easier or harder in the new version? I would say for moving databases, the process is going to be, I would say you would have more steps in OM12. So I would say I'd move it before to make it easier for you later. Okay. Um, and I mean, a general rule if upgrading to OM12, if you're a management group for whatever reason, is not healthy. Um, Upgrading to OM12 is not going to fix that. You should try to get your management group in a healthy state before upgrade, so you have less complications when you do run your upgrade through. I think I had a question over there. Did I? Was it you? Oh, okay. So the, in, OM, in R2, the bottleneck actually was the RMS, hands down. Uh, the, the RMS was, was always under considerable load, um, and it was, without question, uh, he, he was the problem in the management group. The DB is now the bottleneck in OM12 because we've taken the RMS out of the equation. Um, so with that said, uh, the DB will be the bottleneck, but we've done a lot of optimizations to make it work really well this time. And for the most part, actually, it worked pretty well in R2. But yeah, all the managed servers still write to it. They still write to the data warehouse at the same time. That hasn't changed. And uh, now we have config service that also uh, writes into it as well. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you use virtual machines for management servers? Yes, we, in fact, that we make sure that that is, uh, uh, we make sure to test that thoroughly uh, to make sure that management servers now are, ver you know, running in Hyper-V or fine. Commodity hardware is, well, <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, yeah, web console is scale, yeah, you can scale out web console. You can build a farm of them if you like. You could do that in R2. 
Yep, you could have multiple web consoles in R2. So, yep. And even the console access, if you look at the SDK, now every management server has the SDK. So if you want to have high availability into the SDK, you could some put in front of that some type of load balancing, let's say an NLB or something, so that you actually point to one virtual address for all the SDK activity from those web console servers. Okay. Well, I'm going to take that gentleman back there first. How do you redirect the console to the right management server? So, in the, in the way we have it currently at beta, you will have to uh, use configure NLB to, and just point at the VIP for your consoles, and then they'll just bounce around whichever one it takes at first. Um, moving past that, we're exploring a couple other additional options, um, and you'll have to stay tuned for that. You could, yeah, I mean, if you wanted to give your, your, uh, your user base just <coughs> one management server name, then they'll just use that one to point to. I mean, yeah, I mean, it just depends on how you hand it out as to which ones people use, right? Um, you can move some, as I showed you a little bit with the pools, you can take some management servers out of a pool and use that only for SDK if you so wanted to. So say you wanted to manage the server and you did not want it to do any of those things that Martin explained, all those things that RMS used to do, you can actually change the pool from automatic to manual, take out the management server you don't want it to participate in doing management group functionality, and then just use that as your SDK server, for example. So you can, there is a little bit of flexibility there. Uh, he, or she does, it's in the front. <laughs> <laughs> He did. <laughs> wow, that was really nice. I, I, wait, can I just, I know there's not many left. How many people are interested in scheduling maintenance mode? All right, keep your hands up if you use a PowerShell to do it right now. Okay, all right. Um, and you're all our two customers right now, so, or because or, you have your hands up, I would assume. So you'll be pleased to know that I'm re releasing a uh, res kit at the end of the month, and I have scheduled maintenance mode as one of the tools. So you guys will uh, be really, and it's fully integrated in Ops Manager. Um, it's a fully integrated solution. So I think uh, for R2, it's a res kit for R2. I did not want to wait for OM12 to ship. Uh, I, 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 I feel the pain, so I want to make sure that you guys uh, get, get the res kit out. So and there's a couple other tools in there too, so you'll check them out, and uh, I will blog it very soon. Yes, sir. Is it possible for service manager, SM, to, to, to request pos scheduled maintenance? That one I'm not sure off offhand. I know VMM has built it in now. So when you move machines in, in, in the new version of Virtual Machine Manager that's coming out, when you move machines around, they're putting things in maintenance. They took, I, know they, I know they put that functionality in, but I'm not sure about service manager. But what you could do, though, is with Opalas or Orchestrator, is orchestrate that, of course with the integration pack to operations manager and the integration pack to service manager. Let's say you have a change request that wants to change this computer CI. Just take that, build a runbook, and put it in maintenance mode with Opalas or Orchestrator. Uh, that would be a good scenario, I think. I want to get that question in the back. That poor gentleman's had his hand up for eons, it seems. See, that's why I wait for the end, because I get such a great question at the very back of the room. His question is, OK, you have multiple management servers, but they're in different sites. What's the best practice around that? Because the pools, you know, the management server is a member of a pool, and they need to be aware of each other and talk to each other very frequently. So how is that going to work? The answer to that is, in OM12, the recommendation is to be always keep your management servers together and deploy gateways and sites. Because you need the management servers talk to each other. They need to know who's up, who's down. Who's got what job? They, they do a lot of uh, you know, negotiating between themselves. And so because of that, any latency you cause could cause you um, some strange performance in the management group itself. So the recommendation in OM12 will be to keep all your management servers together. And you'll actually see that in the upgrade notes is I'll say, if you have a management server that's in another site, you want to swap that out for a gateway as you go through preparing for upgrade. I thought I had one over here as I'm moving back this way. Mm. An agent has no clue what a resource pool is. 
He performs exactly how he does in R2. He gets a primary and a list or a secondary if he's manually installed, and he just knows who to fail over to. If, because if you think about it, there's, if a management server were to go down and somehow be able to tell the agent, it would be, how would it know to get to the agent if the agent's using it? It, it has to come from the agent bottom up is the way it's got to work. No, no, no. So if you're, it, it's the same as it is in R2. You install an agent, just push install to what, whichever you know, management server you select, and then uh, when it gets its configuration, it gets the list of all the other management servers. And we just send it down. You don't need to specify that. Yes, sir? Yes, because they're legacy. So they'd be running in a legacy mode. That's an excellent question. Yeah, if the, R, if the machine that happens to be hosting the RMS emulator were to fail, yes, the management pack would be, would, whatever functionality it had wouldn't be working, right? Because it, it, that instance isn't loaded anymore. Um, so, I mean, as we communicate to our partners, they, we don't want to break their existing management packs. We want to be back and pat, but they also need to change them in such a way that they work with the pool and that their instance will float around in the pool so they don't, you know, have an outage or a monitoring blackout. Um, but you can easily, if the worst case, you go to another one and you just type in the commandlet, it's like that, to just make that one the, the emulator. Um, what? Yeah, you can go, you can even run it from the client. It's just a PowerShell commandlet. And it'll just set the emulator on a different machine and you're done uh, if you ever lose one. So it's not a big deal. But remember, the management group itself doesn't care about the, the RMS instance. We have no dependencies on it whatsoever. If that thing fails, the management group functions. Everything works. The only thing that doesn't work is a legacy MP that may have used that old instance. Can you release it? It just depends on how your discovery is written, right? A management pack goes wherever the discovery rule, you know. Yep. I think three minutes left. Okay. Uh, thank you for those that stayed.